go to this computer. Okay. We are good. Hello, good afternoon. Um, and, um, and welcome to, uh, or good whenever you're watching this, and welcome to um, this chat. Very excited to, um, to speak to these wonderful people this afternoon um, who are uh, movers and shakers in their own right and um, who have um, been working and, uh, on a book called Movement Integration. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Martin Lundgren and Linus Johansson. We'll get to the other suspicious looking chap who's lurking around later on. Uh, so, uh, which is which, you might say. Um, I'm the only person with hair, but let's, let's start with, with Linus um, and say hi, Linus. Hey all, Linus Johansson from Sweden. Nice and to see you, or nice for you to look at me, <laughs> brother. <laughs> and Martin. Yes. So, so, that's what, so now we know who, who these people are. And then yeah. the, uh, the, other, the other character is my sparring partner and uh, very good friend and uh, lovable little rogue and um, just somebody I adore hanging out with. Um, and, and that's the skeleton in the background. So say hello, skeleton in the background. <laughs> it's Gary Carter. Hi, Gary. Hi, yeah. How are you doing? I'm doing very, very well. It's all the, all, all the better for seeing you. Um, so, um, so these Martin and uh, and Linus came on a dissection of mine in Nottingham some years ago. I'm not exactly sure what year it was, but it was. Any idea? Any idea, guys? 2018, maybe. Was it? Yeah. 2018, so, something like that. Anyway, it must have been 16 or 17. It, it was oh, 16. Time, but, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, as well as teaching them some very questionable English phrases, uh, we sat down and uh, they, Martin and Linus, had this idea for uh, a book um, called Movement Integration and wanted to know whether um, we would be interested in um, uh, contributing to the ch chapter to it, Gary and myself. And of course we said yes, uh, because they bought us beer and um, we sat in the beer garden, we, we talked through. And um, so, and the result is this, this is the, um, it's been published through Lotus Publishing, uh, which is um, the same uh, publishing house as, as mine. So John Hutchings at Lotus has published this. Um, and um, I have to say, um, I haven't read it. No, I have, I have sort of flicked through it. Um, and it's, it's kind of cool, it's a nice book. But Linus, talk us, give us, give me an idea what, where, where your thinking was in terms of what, why did you, what were you wanting to put into, um, into this cover? What was your, hopefully your whole model approach and what were you trying to achieve? Yeah, so the background is that me and Martin, we met a couple of um, years ago. We've had the same background uh, in education and um, Martin one was one of the few in Sweden that worked that way that I was interested in knowing more of and get deeper into. So our uh, path crossed and soon we developed a good friendship and uh, also a collaboration. Collaboration, And uh, Martin is both a colleague, dear friend, and also a teacher and mentor. And he taught me and together we developed a more systemic approach. And we will have to dive into that deeper further on. But a systemic approach to see and appreciate and work with the human form and function and that's really what we try to to capture and to to put into sentences and images in this book more systemic and less uh, reductionistic view where you view parts and bits more well, seeing it as a system that is we'll come we'll come back to that idea of systemic yes. uh in, in a minute um and but martin what what do you you know, there's, there's two words that are very powerful words in here. There's movement and there's integration. So what do you, how do you consider that you can integrate movement and what are you integrating it into? So that's a really good question. Uh, I think uh, there are different ways to look at movement, but we look at movement in a interrelative way. And when you look at in, uh, move it in an interrelative way, uh, you look at how different elements in the body uh, relates and how they move together, or how they. Do you understand me? Yeah, I how they don't know. move together. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's really so the trick. Integration is more about how uh, how you can develop uh, more efficiency and. Uh, to get these 
parts or, or elements to work together in a better way. You could say. Mm, okay. Um, so Gary, just talk us through a little bit about about because give us your background in terms of because um, you're a, you're a big movement man, and um, you know that you use the word yoga pro probably probably in in a way that is not necessarily fully followed. So what was your what was your insight and what do you think this book was going to be about? Um, what, I, what I thought it was about is exactly what it is about in terms of what the guys were talking about from, I, I would see in terms of structural integration because I've been trained in that method of uh, manual therapy, um, is that I found that there was something missing in the whole structural integration process, which as you know, is kind of born out of rolfing. Um, but there isn't really a kind of, I'll use the word movement integration in terms of uh, the, the structural integration brother. They, they talk about Rolf movement systems and stuff like that, but there was nothing applied within the schools that I went through that had movement involved in it. And um, when I was observing um, the, the uh, practice sessions that were uh, shown to us by our tutors at the time, when they would talk about adding movement to the system, it was, it was something that really didn't relate to what I understood in, in a moving body. And I'd found that whenever I was working with various clients and students with my previous practices, I'm also a Shatsu practitioner as well, as <clears throat> so I would have them on the floor and then I would move them and do the practice with them, have them move again, do some work and then get them up and move around and then show me their patterns that they do in life. <clears throat> and then you'd see where, it's a bit like clothing that's got a little bit snagged, you'd see that the system's not moving so well. You might make, need to make <clears throat> maybe a change in the tissues there and then watch them move again and you'd see them integrate it. I think this is the issue and, and, and this is the thing that, you know, when we talk about uh, movement integration of function, um, there's an assumption that we understand what function is in, in, a, broad, in a broad church. And I think my, my urge to people is to say, look, function is, is, is individual dependent. You know, one person's function, re functional requirement of being 94 and being at home and able to get to the toilet on time and still be with their cat is very different to a 26 year old who, who wants to, you know, run a 250 meter hurdle or what have you. Um, so so we, we assume we talk about function in the same way, but of course we don't. And so Gary's idea of getting people up and showing you what their function is, the ability to reach the cupboard and get the mugs out. So um, what's your take on the concept of, of from somebody that is very functional, i.e. you, Linus, and you talk about this in certain ways, what's your take on this, on this model that we have? Yeah, well, it's, it's exactly the same. And that's why the, the, the word assumption is perhaps the, the greatest word to really acknowledge and, and drag into the light because a lot of things out there in the world of movements and in, like, in amongst us therapists is based on assumptions. And what we really need to do is to crack those open and see what are they based on? What do you assume you mean when you say function? And what we try to do and what are in this book is really to create a framework within you can put these assumptions and put them to the test and see if is this really the function that you need or the function that is suitable for you in that state you are in or in that time span of your life that you are in at the moment. So what we need to create is a dynamic view and, and perspective that adapts to the person and allows uh, us to develop that person's function in relation to where they are in life and the need that they have. Or, although sprung from the idea that we are all from the same seed, somehow the same DNA, we have this movement DNA within us that developed us to these bipedal movers on our feet with our free hands. We differ from cats and dogs that move in other ways. So we have this basic pattern that gives us this perspective that we can draw what we need from it and give that person exactly in that shape sure. and form and need of function. That and, they... and the trouble, the trouble is within our industry, we reduce it to a system of parts. And Martin says, uh, a, a very profound sentence in the book where he says, um, uh, uh, talks about the reductionist paradigm um, and, uh, and says the deepest um, metaphysical premise 
um, is that the, it, the is that the world is a world of objects, um, and uh, and goes on to um, to talk about illustration and movement later on in the book. Um, I think I think that's very a very profound statement, and um, I hate you for your ability to use the English language so beautifully um, as a, as a non-English speaker. Um, so I hate you, admire you. It's, it's amazing. Can you talk a bit on that, Martin, about, about this, uh, explain your sentence a little bit more. Firstly, explain what your understanding of a paradigm is um, the, and the reductionist paradigm and the, the idea of a world. And I find this, it's a lovely, profound statement. I'm going to steal it and use it and quote you with it. The, 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 the assumption again is that the world is a world of objects. Yeah, so uh, I think a paradigm you could uh, you could say is a it's a metaphysical view of the world uh, which under you operate. Uh, so it governs the way you see the world, uh, how you interact with the world, and how, how yeah yeah it also it also governs uh, the concepts uh, you come up with and um, yeah mm. so. With the reductionistic paradigm, um, uh, the assumption is that the world is a world of objects, and for some people, it's it's uh, how could it be otherwise, you know? Mm. Uh, and it's a real hard time. It can be really hard, can be really hard to see uh, another paradigm. So. Yeah, I think as humans, we've tended to remove ourselves from the idea that we are part of the natural world, that we are a species and mammals within within a, an operational sphere of other things. And so we've tended yeah. to place ourselves as, a, as, as above all that, not to understand that we are part of a, of a, of a natural process um, and our huge brains have managed to somehow blot out the rest of the, uh, the world and, and what's going on. Um, Something I posted the other day was was the fact that you know uh, this year alone um, there's there's something in the region two and a half million children under the age of five have died around the world um, so that's a that's a frightening thing but we, we remove ourselves from that and so we look at the world as a as a series of objects that we're not really necessarily related mm -hmm. to and so if you contrast to to the systemic paradigm uh, it's it's a world of processes. Instead. Mm. Oh. I want, I want to get on to I want to get on to this. I want to come back to the systemic thing in a minute, but I just wanted to uh, ask Gary again in terms of um, in terms of understanding and helping people to understand that that movement um, and these paradigms of objects that we are we're not objects, but that we we have to fit in. How do you, how does your ethos in terms of teaching movement um, relate to that to that and and try to get people away from that that sort of objectifying idea? Um, it's a tricky one, Jules, because um, from the background I came from, I was, I was a competitive cyclist. I was going to become a pro cyclist at one point. And we had a really amazing coach that always spoke to us in terms of feel. So there, in any of the training that we did, we were never really given any understanding of too much anatomy. Um, you know, any, any work that would be called stretching was elasticity training. And it was about how our body moved in relation to the bike, into relation to the ground and the space around us. So it, it was, I'd never ever heard any other coach in my life in terms of movement speak like that. And it, it, I think it just set me up along a particular path that I always viewed it from a different perspective. And, and luckily, and you, you hear me talk about this man a lot, my father was always that way thinking. So he was looking at the wonders of the universe and trying to figure out how we fitted into that. So, you know, I was struggling at such a young age to try and understand what the hell he was talking about, but it, it had me view the body so differently. Mm. And when it came to training and bodybuilding, and when people were talking about, well, I'm training this area, luckily, I again, I had another guy that was saying, well, yeah, but if you're training the biceps, you've got to figure out how the calves are responding to that. Yeah. You yeah, it brings, us, it brings us nicely on to our, well done, Gary. Brilliant, brilliant segue there. Brings us on to our, our next as aspect. I was writing something this morning and it struck me, um, I know it sounds obvious, but I know a lot of really good anatomists. Um, and uh, when I say an anatomist, I'll, I'll talk to you whether it's a, an anatomist in a lab or a clinical anatomist. And the anatomists are people that will understand the name of a structure, what it is, where it is, be able to point to and explain you the function. But if you take them out and you show them and you say, what do you think about that person? They know a lot about an the human anatomy, but very little about the human. Yeah. So that's a very interesting disconnect. And, and I wanted to come to Linus um, and, and Linus talks about um, 
uh, another, again, very profound statement. Every time you open this book, there's something that leaps up at you. Um, and um, one says, uh, Lena says, um, there are no borders between structures. Um, it is all one. It's very profound, man. It's like Buddhist, isn't it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like one where, maybe one with everything, says, said, the, said the Buddhist monk to the hot dog salesman. And um, there's an end to that joke as well, where, where he gives him $5 and for a $3 hot dog and he doesn't get any change back. And the, the, the Buddhist monk says to the hot dog seller, where's my, my change? And the, Buddhist, the, the hot dog seller says, change can only come from within. So carrying on this sentence, uh, Linus then says, um, there are no borders between structures, it is all one. Therefore, we must acknowledge that the structures we speak of can only truly be seen through function. It's a bold statement. Um, all those structures that we name as parts must be viewed uh, with very blurred lines. And we must acknowledge that these imaginary lines are only for explanatory and educational purposes. And therein lies the problem. Therein lies the problem. We learn anatomy as manual and movement therapists that is broken down, created with lines, um, explained to us in a very medical way that we can then go and learn to pass an exam. And nobody's really putting this back together again. Um, and, I, and I think that, that's, that paragraph sort of sums up um, a lot of what I've been trying to look at for the last sort of 15 years. So, um, so yeah, do, I'd like you to sort of just um, expound more on that and we can start to talk a bit, a bit about more the, uh, the, the systems that you mentioned earlier on. Yeah, so that, you know, somehow I, through what I've read and what I, I've, I've understood and how I've moved, I've come to the realization that this must be it. Still, the books told me that I was existing of bits and pieces. And that's why I came on your dissection course and with Martin, and that's where we met Gary, to, to prove for myself that it's wrong. What sits, what, what, what's written in the book cannot be. And, you know, diving into the human form, you know, it takes three seconds before, you know, everything you thought you held to be true is just shattered. It's right there in front of your eyes. But you also come to the realization that the people who were the first explorers that tried to get into this and understand it, they needed to organize it somehow. They needed to be able to create structural bits, pieces to be able to pass on the knowledge. So of course they created the truth in relation to what they thought they were going to find. And we can only say that thanks to that, we can now say that mm, that fits very well in some paradigms and in some perspectives but we who wants to move and see, treat and acknowledge the body in a different way, we can see that that is not fitting our perspective and we need to develop something else to be able to describe uh, and pass on what we see and feel and, and acknowledge that in the complexity that lies within. So we can only thank those that you know went before us and created that perspective and and that is also what i would like to add that you know when we when we came to this world we didn't come with a handbook that said that this part fits to that and you know if that's broken then do it like this everything is up for you know you can see it view it per, uh, describe it in any perspective you want to and just because they were the first to describe it that way in bits and pieces it necessarily doesn't hold it to be true. It can be true in some perspectives. No, I, I mean, the, the idea is, is the, the, the principle is, is that you keep repeating something often enough, it becomes, it becomes, a, it becomes a truth, however, yeah. however misguided. And, um, but it, it brings us to the issue of, of, of at some can point... I, can I, can sorry, I'll ask something? you, Martin, this next thing. It, it brings to the point that we have to somehow explain it. We have to somehow um, be able to do that, to, to explain it. And the complexity of the human form doesn't lend itself to just being able to say it's all one man. And, and you talk about this in your chapter about um, the, the way of illustrating movement in your, in your color illustration model. Um, and, um, you know, how is this the best way? Is this a starting point? How do we best start to explain this and break this down in ways that, that um, um, allow us to learn things in sections, but also allow us to have an integration perspective? Yeah, and I think the, 
coming back to the question you just asked, I think the big, biggest difference is uh, between looking at uh, trying to understand movement from the current anatomy perspective. Instead sure. of uh, trying try to understand anatomy and begin from movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a re really big difference. And we're going to get another view of anatomy if we start with movement. And there isn't, can I, there isn't a language of movement anatomy. You know, we, the, the people that, that are trying to describe movement are using it in anatomical terms, but there isn't an, an anatomy of movement in terms of a language yet. So we're kind of scrabbling around in the dark trying to find a way to describe it. But I don't, I think the anatomy, and this is something I say a lot, the anatomy gets in the way when you're trying to teach people movement. It just stops them. Then they become mechanical. So, I used to teach at yeah. a, um, a dance university and they, they get me on year two. So year one, they get their basic anatomy. And what happens is I would watch them start moving at the beginning of year one and they were fluid and all over the place. At the end of year one, they'd learn basic anatomy and they were moving like robots because they thought it was all hinges and levers. Well, this is the problem we come up with, with again, going back to the thing of, of, of where, where Martin talks about language. We have these idea of things like the core and, and people, because anatomy is a medical model. It's a, it's a, it's a model that has been designed by medicine. Um, and so we're teaching, and it, the same thing goes because my, my, um, my background and my work isn't within movement, uh, but was in manual therapy, but we're teaching movement and manual therapists a, a medical model of anatomy that doesn't fit in with their experience of the world. Um, and their experience of handling other people. So, uh, Martin, you wanted to carry on something? Can yeah, yes. Right. So, the color illustration model is a, uh, it's a way to look at movement first. And it, if you want to look at anatomy, I think anatomy makes more sense, sense if we look at uh, movement first and understand movement before we look at anatomy. Then, for example, uh, um, fiber directions and uh, how the muscles are um, positioned and uh, I think they make more sense if you start with movements and they mean something else also. So and you should have a proposal think that, we would, that we could take um, second year undergraduate uh, medical students uh, and give them uh, a, a brief movement session to explain uh, anatomy or, or after each section of their lower limb class that they come and they do a a movement session to then integrate what they're learning. Yeah, that uh, sure would be interesting. So I think the, the the current the current anatomy uh, anatomy model is good if you wanna if if you wanna learn medicine or become a doctor. But you know, it's not good for if you wanna if you wanna get a comprehensive view of how movement works. It's it's it doesn't really work, you know, to because you have left out gravity, for example, you know, and yeah. it's. It's a very limited view of, of uh, how the body works. Sure. So the uh, classic anatomy has, yeah, it has saved the life of both my father and my grandfather. Before the jaws of death gets a hold of you, a doctor that knows uh, clinical anatomy can go, go in through a vein, they can change, they can, you know, they can operate, they can do all that stuff. And that's just before, you know, saving you from death. We, as movers and as therapists, we're not working closely to death. We're working as close to being as perfect as you can in your body, being free of pain, moving well, moving freely. And, and using that terminology and those ideas that really are for medicine and applying them to the end of the other spectrum where you really want to be uh, somewhere else in your body, then sure we need another way of seeing you and talking and expressing that uh, that's really my point that that you have to see that you are in a spectrum when i get to the hospital close to death i sure want a doctor that knows what the he's on about that can cut me where he needs to cut me and mend or do whatever you using the classic anatomy using that paradigm but when my knee hurts and that's not killing me I want someone that can see how my entire system gets into my knee and where I need to work to be free and more movable to lessen the strain and the pressure and the pain in my knee so I can run 
again, this really two ends. Yeah, we don't have, we don't have, nobody puts that together uh, for our undergraduate doctors, and it's something that has, has been uh, bothering me for years. And, and, and yeah. uh, you know, you, you, and then you speak to a GP who's 20, 15, 20 years down into their career, and, and, and they say, oh, I, I can't, you know, arse and elbow type thing. They can't remember their anatomy from undergraduate studies. And so it's a subject that's learned and tended to be forgotten about. Um, and nobody really puts those relationships back together again. You know, the head weighs 12 or 14 pounds or six or seven kilos. And so it's any basic understanding of physics is going to tell you that if you move your head in a direction, it's going to change the load through your knees. Um, well, that's obvious. A five-year-old could understand that, but it's not embedded into our understanding of, of, of the human. So again, human anatomy and human function, that there's that disconnect as far as that's concerned. Um, yeah. So... You know, and, and again, so this is the kind of thing that, that when uh, people like Gary talk about yoga, this is what, you know, this is what my understanding of what he's talking about is, is how is that balance of movement um, created in the body? Yeah. Do you want to speak on that, Gary, a bit? Yeah, and it, you know, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's a, a set of, it's a balance of forces. You know, Martin was saying that, you know, the gravity is always missed out. You see this in any anatomy, but they don't talk about gravity when they're considering the anatomy of a body or when someone's talking about an aim in the system, they don't include gravity in the system. You know, so, you know, you, you think about Pilates, yoga, Tai Chi, anything, even you, Julian, with climbing, gravity is always an issue. It's yeah. not an issue, it's, it's a constant. So how do, we, how do we negotiate gravity all of the time and can we do it well? And when, when, when you see someone moving well, there's, there's a relationship of them and them in gravity and everything just seems to work harmoniously. The moment something's just a little bit off kilter, you start to see a change in their rhythm. Um, you know, as you know, I live many years in Brighton and you see people walking along Brighton seafront with their dogs. And if you saw the dog with a limp, you would notice it before you'd notice the human with a limp. It's true. Because the human is just like, well, that's just normal. They have a limp. We expect that of the humans. But you see an animal with a limp, you see the rhythm's gone completely. You know, why is it we just accept that people, humans, would have the same, you know, have the limp and it's just part of the process, not necessarily. And coming back to something Linus was talking about from your previous question, other than us being out there being manual therapists, I think one of the roles here is to, for the people that are interested enough, is to give them back the information so that they know how to take care of themselves. Mm. You know, it gives them what you naturally have as an instinct, look after yourself. But every now and again, of course, they would need to go and see the doctor. They would need to see the bone practitioner or the other manual therapist. But eventually, all of that stuff that we talk about, we have. We learn to feel it. W what point did we disjoint ourselves from ourselves? And then the anatomy books are confirming it all over again. Sure. Yeah, there, there is a huge disconnect. And you can understand why it's got there. Um, I, I want to come to Linus in a second and ask him about... Uh, these clever words that he's using um, and but Martin I, I, I want to say to you um, if you could change one thing about uh, the study of the of, of the human form tomorrow you can only choose one thing what would it be what would you either add or take away or change about how we start about teaching anatomy or the study of the human form um, I, I would add the understanding of how movements of bone relate to the body if uh, that makes sense. Mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. So instead of look, looking at muscles or and trying to, to understand movements from a concentric perspective, you start to look at how the bones move in relation to each other. Yeah. Uh, I think it's coming up with a mission statement, isn't it? By saying, right, before you start studying anatomy, understand that everything functions in relation to everything else. And you have to try and understand those relationships and even mm. though we're going to break it down into its component parts, you have to remember that there are no component parts and they all have to come back together. Which brings me neatly on to my, to my next question um, to Linus, which is, um, I'd like you to explain a word for me, please, uh, which it yeah. features in this book. Um, do you know the, what the word I'm going to be talking about in chapter 11? I is? think I do. I think I do. Is it ensomatosy? En ensomatosy. And somatosy, how do you want to, where do you want to put the emphasis? Which syllable yeah, do you want to put the emphasis on? Um, and so it's an E N S O M A T O S Y. So talk yeah. us through, talk us through this word and the definition yeah. of it um, and, and what your take on it is. Yeah. So, so what happens is that the, the, 
the phrase of the word anatomy, which means in Greek to cut up, has taken has therapy and it gives us a clear description of and states how the body is constructed and how everything is put together with bits and pieces. And what we're trying constantly and what we see we're people trying constantly trying to do is still use the word anatomy and just add something else to it. Functional anatomy, holistic anatomy, always not letting go of that word and also that perspective entirely. So what we wanted to do is just shift all together, not saying that that is wrong and not true, because it is, that's a perspective and that's the truth within itself if you want to accept that, but also say that there could be another perspective, another view, and we needed another word for it that was completely different or, you know, in some way pr pronounced the same. So actually in Brighton at the Mad Hatter Cafe, Googling away, Google Translate from English to Greek, typing in integration and there, boom, right in my face, ensomatisy, meaning both integration, embodiment and cooperation. All those three words in one beautiful Greek word. With that beautiful word, if you take away the en and toss it in the end, you get soma. That means body. Within the word ensomatisy lies the Greek word soma, which means body. The embodiment, the incorporation, the, the cooperation, the integration. And just taking that word, giving the new perspective, and really just tossing it out in the world and letting people somehow fill it up themselves with the, with the understanding and with the experience of, if I do it the other way, instead of seeing bits and pieces and trying to understand movement, what if I begin with movement? It's just me, the floor beneath me, and gravity. And if I start to move within these frames, what can I feel, what can I sense, how, what can I understand? And what I need is, why would I need this? I need this hook that tells me, okay, I need to understand this because I want to do what? We always need to have this what, why? Because I want to work with people, I want to treat people, I want to feel them, make them feel lighter, stronger, freer, less pain. Sure, then we'll go from this perspective and aim for that. Or I want to do this and just move myself free or just, you know, whatever. We always need the why to be able to, to go somewhere. We need to understand where we are and we need to understand where we want to go. And from there we can use either the classic anatomy perspective or we can use a new and somatisy perspective and we can try to create a new path with perhaps well a new language is it's difficult but we're trying word by word to 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 you know broaden the language because the language is really what sets us back a lot yeah you, you you quote me here and, I, and something i say a lot that, that that it's dangerous to make assumptions about function and movement based on dissecting people who are no longer functional and moving. Um, and it's yeah. one of my favorite things to say to people is that we're always telling a story, we're always uh, creating an idea. And so it's taking lots of different resources and trying to put them together to come up with a, with a bigger picture and trying to find as many different ways of explaining that as possible, you know, whether it be uh, color or what have you. And, um, and, so, and so this, this, this I, I think when you say the word soma, I don't just think about body, but I think about the whole way of how we can understand the body of the human rather than it's you know it's intellectual it's emotional it's it's all these things there's something i talk about which is emotional stiffness if i'm angry then i will lay down that connective tissue if i'm open and loose i, I will you know and and movement isn't necessarily about sitting on the floor uh, like you're doing there um it can be movement from an eyelid or a, or a head or a shoulder yeah. it, it's it's related to the function of the individual um, and um, so, um, yeah. just a couple of a couple of things. We, one of the things that I that I I read this morning, um, which made me laugh, was that one of the reasons we're not in a room. And I'd love to do. A, I think it'd be great to do a weekend workshop based on this book with 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 the contributors, and it would be great to do that. But I read an article this morning that says that within this current virus, um, people who are suffering from obesity have a higher rate. Um, of, of death and, and serious conditions. Um, and, the, and the study sort of says, well, we're not sure why. 
and it's like, duh, um, do, do you think that the tendency for, 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 for obesity will be for people that don't tend to move? And the whole idea of movement, why do we move as humans to drive our fluids around? And why do we drive our fluids around? Because they, every system of the body is designed to move fluid, clean fluid, replace fluid, get rid of fluid and, and distribute fluid. And it's about the cleaning system. That movement is the ultimate cleaning system for humans. We're this big bag of dirty fluid that we need moving around. And how you move it around, uh, nobody cares, you know, but move it around. Um, so, um, big dirty bag of fluids. We are. Okay, we a bag, one 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 bag of stinky fluid. fluid. If, if you don't move your stinky fluids around, it gets sick and non-moving fluid becomes septic you know you don't drink out of a green yeah. puddle man you know i've been saying people have been teaching online is that you know a lot of these people are in their houses some of them don't have gardens sure so, you know getting them moving and then what we've done is we've kind of found ways to kind of creatively move their furniture about so they create a bit more of an obstacle course for them to move but a lot of people <laughs> are spending a lot of time sitting now a lot long more than normal so all of the sort of patterns that we might have seen that were being attended to in the 80s and early 90s with low back issues and you know, constant sitting is beginning to return a bit more. And also people aren't wearing shoes, so their feet are beginning to collapse a bit on them. They're not really, they talk about you know, being barefoot all the time, but if you haven't done the work to maybe support the foot well, all of that barefoot stuff just goes to waste. Do you know what, somebody asked me recently, what could I best, what exercise could I best do? I said, have you got a kitchen? They said, yes. I said, have you got a cupboard up there? And they said, yes. I said, what's in it? They said, the cups are up there. I said, have you got a cupboard down here? And they said, yes. I said, what's in the cupboard down here? And they said, are my tin foods? I said, take all the cups out of the cupboard and put them on the counter. Take all the tins and put them where the cups were. And then take all the cups and put them down there. And they're like, and then what? I'm like, that'll do you. Or put your coffee over there, the sugar over there, the milk up there. Exactly. Every time you make when you're changing your brain and you're bending down and doing all that stuff, do that and then tomorrow do a different one. Um, yeah. Martin, what's missing from this book? What did you have to leave out? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, well, uh, I, I left a lot of things out, you know. Uh, it would be being a bit too complicated i think to include everything you know yeah but okay, can I'm I'm just... you, what did you leave out which which bit is the bit that you had to fight with yourself to decide uh, it, yeah it's a bit hard you know but uh, to keep it simple you know for gate made simple it was really hard to keep it simple <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this, this book isn't simple. Look, this book is not an entry level book. You know, I'm not going to say to somebody first stepping out onto their, their career of movement or manual therapy, get, pick this book up. There's a, a lot of heavy stuff in this book and, and, um, um, and it's, not a, it's not a simple book. And so, you know. But, but and I, I, think, I think what's lacking actually is uh, a practical uh, perspective. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, when you start to read, you get it from an intellectual uh, level, but you need to get it into your hands and your body and then learn the theory or have a, have a relationship, you know, with, with the embodiment and uh, learning how to do manual interventions or using the body or whatever you do, you know, and then learn. That's what, so you don't need yeah, there's a lot of passion and a lot of ideas and a lot of feeling and a lot of opinion in this book. Um, and um, it comes from people who are, are very experienced and who've, you know, it, it, it makes an assumption about prior knowledge to the reader. Um, and um, I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily, but I would, I would say to anybody that, you know, that um, if you don't know a, a lot of the existing language, then, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be something that you're going to go, right, I'm going to have to come back to it. It's not an oh. easy read. Mm. Not. But Martin, if I could ask you, the, the hardest the hardest thing with this book, right, was actually writing it all together because both, we all know this, but, but I must say that you, Martin, more than anyone else I know, are in a constant transition, always moving forward, always developing, and writing a book, and you expressed this uh, when you had to write w who you were and what you did, <laughs> and you said, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I do. I, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I do because each day changes because you find something new, you experience something new and you feel that you grow all the time very slowly. But writing a book is also a slow job. 
And what happens is that this becomes a constant. This is written now. This is milestone. This is a tunk, a spear in the ground. So it's in that sense, it's very good. But it's also extremely challenging when you've got that sense that, yeah, this is cool stuff, but there is more, but I haven't discovered it yet. I haven't put words to it yet. I haven't found it yet. Wouldn't you say that that's how I, I know you experienced that that way? Yeah, yeah, I did. So, it, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, you that, that, yeah, by that leaving, you know, a lot of stuff out that that is that things that are going to come. That's why we need to write a second one. I think, I think what we've all I think what we've all done is it's like it's like the, the the equation of it's very hard for a multi-millionaire to understand you know the need to shop at uh, the discount supermarket to save forty pence on a tin of beans and you know we 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 come from a combination of you know probably a hundred odd years of of experience between us all hundred and two hundred with including the other contributors in the book um, and yeah. and we're coming at it at that level of going well man you know we've we've come down this route we've done through the traditional anatomy um we've seen these clients and we have a view on it um from a from a historical point of view um and um trying to explain something like this it's simply um at an entry level is is is, is tricky so we, we use yeah. language and um and stuff that we all understand but um gary what you were going to add on to that okay, i think that's where we all kind of sit in the same place and you know our meeting of minds has come about because we're I think we're constantly progressive with our own self-inquiry and we're, we're constantly questioning everything that we're doing, which keeps evolving yeah. it. You know, the ideas we might have had a long time ago, it's constantly changing. And as Lena said, yeah, the book is a point that's there. But, you know, the story so far would be a good title of that because it's only at that moment in time. And then five years down the line, there's different experiences again, different knowledge. And, you know, you might even look back at this and think, well, I don't, I don't believe in that anymore because it's changes so much. Yeah. But once the book's written, it's there. And a lot of people will hold the book and say, well, that's it. You know, you've, you've said that and that's how you hang on to things. It's that, well, no, you let it go after a while. Because each body you work with, and Jules, you know this as well, everyone's so different. You can't put that there's this one movement pattern that's going to, is one size fits all. Sure. I've seen this in the yoga world, the Pilates world, and so on is that the person takes their body and they try and cram that round peg into the square hole and smash it in there and then wonder why they've got injuries by doing that when they didn't listen to themselves. Uh, yeah, Martin, did you want to comment on any of that? No, it's, it's, it's a constant uh, investigation or, or ex experimentation as well and uh, clarification, making better explanations and trying to understand things better uh, sure I, I mean i've written this i've written two books on on bowen um and i've contributed chapters to lots of things and, and written lots of things and i've never met anybody um who's who's written a book that doesn't want to get to the end of it and go yeah it was crap and want to start again um and and the whole process of producing something like this uh, means that you sort of have, have done that learned from it and the learning means that you want to start again um I, th I think where, where any book like this fails, and I don't want to go on failure, is the fact that it doesn't ask us anything. It doesn't say to us, and I think this is where we need to, as a movement, go, right, what do we need to do as a human race in order to, to, to have a, a, a paradigm shift onto behaving differently or understanding differently? And I don't think any book can necessarily do that. Uh, but I think that's maybe where we need to... Uh, when in our industry, our movement and our manual therapy industry start to go, well, you know, we're, we're missing out. We don't, this hasn't been considered within our current crisis. Um, but I think, yeah. Focus. Well, I think when uh, people understand the, the importance, you know, of genetic uh, development and how it affects your emotions, uh, your overall development and your relationships, you know, and how you are in the world and everything, you know. I think if people would understand that, they would take it more seriously and uh, would be more of importance to, uh, I think to it develop. Comes, it comes even earlier, we don't, have a, we don't have a systematic approach to teach our young people the importance of movement um, and touch and, uh, and what happens if you don't. You know, we're, not, uh, we're, we're not engendering, we, we're, we're giving them physical education 
um, um, which people hate generally because it's organized bullying or has been <laughs> my experience as a child, um, institutionalized bullying, but we don't really Im import the importance of if you don't keep moving, you are not going to be able to move in the future and, and, uh, and impress that upon people. And it's, it's also, uh, you have, you, you use your body as an object, you know, like how fast can I run, uh, uh stuff like this instead of uh, you're leaving out the subjective part of uh, being a human you know sure. uh, like the synesthetic development should be uh, it should make it easy for you to handle emotions handling stress and uh, being in the world in a, in a in a nicer way you know more comfortable way yeah sure instead of just uh, trying to achieve uh, certain body looks or uh, yeah running it this fast or whatever um thank you guys i'm gonna uh call call time on us now because we're gonna run out of time but uh i would like to say that the, that um a lot of the people who um contribute to this book gary carter Asa Harmon, um celia cecilia gustafson lucas henriksen uh, lena bjorn's daughter and gary ward and jerry hesh um um they're not well, Gary Carter was in it, but a lot of these people aren't obviously in the uh, in the chat today. So um, thank you, guys. I'm looking forward to maybe some stage getting together over a weekend and we can we can run a workshop and, and talk through our ideas um, with people. Um, I think that would be a, an amazing thing. Um, it was a pleasure to, to, to contribute to this project. Um, thank you for your hard work and your initiative and, um, and, and getting Gary to write it in, in time as well. So well done on that. <laughs> Um, yeah, th thank you, Julian, because you were really one of the first stepping stones into this, the meeting with you and the connection you made for us with Lotus. So you are a big deal to this book that it actually happened and it, that it became this. So we're very grateful for your contribution and for you helping us into this. Absolute so, pleasure. I, I, I pride myself, you know, in, in the olden days, yeah. that's what I say in my chat with my uh, dissection guys, is that what I do is I, I specialize in not being particularly good at anything, uh, but bringing people around me who are, um, and, then, and then making, allowing that magic to happen. Um, and things like, you know, my dissections now in, in, in Scotland where I have them, uh, we have Ebay running a movement session, we have, um, you know, Oliver running a, uh, a manual therapy session uh, in order to bring movement into these dissections. Um, and, uh, and then um, Anna Barrett Seguren, who's an incredible uh, Pilates and movement teacher, uh, again, is going to be running these sessions as well with us. So, um, you know, it's part of that whole thing that, you know, just dissecting um, dead people doesn't help us, but um, it's part of the whole weight of evidence that we're going to have and, and the whole, it's a great read. I do suggest that, uh, that anybody that's involved in any kind of uh, therapy, under, interested in, in body-wide anatomy, um, integrating movement and stuff like that, have, pick it up and have a little look at it and, um, and stay in touch and we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be a workshop, um, doing a workshop soon. So thank you once again, uh, chaps. Um, stay safe and um, look forward to being in your physical company at some stage in the not too distant future where we can talk rubbish and drink beer again yeah sounds great say sounds hi to Nate. say goodbye to the people bye bye, bye people <laughs>